Hello, everyone. Really happy to see you all here on Friday on EuroPython. It's a really nice conference. Do you like the conference so far? Thumbs up, thumbs down, yeah. It's, for me, it's my first conference outside of Bulgaria, so I'm blown away by the organization, by the venue, by the city, by the heat. No, I'm lying about the heat. Uh, I'm Radoslav Georgiev. Yes, I know Eastern European names are hard to pronounce, so just call me Rado. Uh, I'm Python and Django developer, doing this every day, and I'm also a founder of a software company called Hacksoft. It's based in Sofia, Bulgaria. We are developing mainly with Python and Django. Uh, some Twitter, GitHub, whatever, if you care. One thing that's uh, highly contextual for this speak is that we have an academy in uh, Sofia where we do Python and Django courses, something like nine in total so far, where we prepare people for their first job and we're quite good at this. Most of our students start working as Python and Django developers. And uh, I am uh, part of the teaching team for almost all of the courses. And this is highly contextual because the goal of this talk today is to share my experience and to be practical and helpful. And I, ha I believe to have a lot of experience because when you're doing a course, there's always, and people are learning new things, there's always someone raising hand and saying, nothing's working, can you take a look? And you go there and you look at different uh, people writing different kinds of Python code. And at some point you start seeing the problems for two seconds and you're saying, oh, you, you have an error here or you have an error here. And while looking at a lot of code, I started seeing some patterns, repeating patterns. And this is actually uh, the, the point of this talk, to be practical, to be helpful, and to see different patterns in debugging, not just tools. I will mention tools in Python, of course. This is Euro Python, But most of this will be patterns. And of course, this is by no means extensive um, lecture or talk. We need an entire week of debug con to cover everything about debugging. It, it's a huge topic, so I won't be extensive. Don't hate me for not mentioning something that you are passionate about. All right, I will talk about three different things that can happen while developing any code, and for, for this talk, Python. First, we will, start, we will start with there's an exception. Everybody has seen stack traces, everybody has seen exceptions, so we'll start with this. Then we will continue at the point where nothing's happening, nothing's working, and things are starting to get frustrating. And we will finish with we got the wrong answer. This is maybe the worst of all. And of course, we will say some common things after all of this because there's always common things to say. All right, let's start. This is my beautiful boxes of frustration level. When we have an exception and we start debugging, it's usually not that frustrating and we'll understand why. So this is level one of frustration. Uh, the running example that I'm going to use because it's easy to use example here is that we have a file with some daytime intervals encoded in strings and we have a Python code that checks if there are overlapping intervals inside. It's not really, it doesn't really matter what I'm going to show you. This is just going to be the example. And we have, yep, we have an exception. And when we have an exception, the first thing that we see, we run the program, there is an exception, and we see a stack trace. And stack traces are actually really, really helpful. This is, uh, this is a friend of the developer while developing, because stack traces, they tell you what actually happened before you hit that exception. Uh, I don't know if you have ever read stack traces from top to bottom. I love, doing, I love reading stack traces. Unless they are like five pages of scroll, then you just scroll them and don't read them at all. But when people start coding, they tend to not read stack traces. It's like, boom, exception, can you please help me? Something's happening. So stack traces are a friend because they contain a lot of valuable information. It's like, on the bottom is the exception, value error. Whatever. And on the top, I don't know if you have read this, but this most recent call last, which means that the, the first thing on the stack trace is the first function that was called, and the last thing on the stack trace is the last function that was called or called executed before we hit that exception. And I have some red arrows to point at 
to point at the information. We have the module, we have the function name, we have the line number. This is really helpful because you have an exception on line 45, you just go to line 45, you don't look for the function, you go to the line. So this is really helpful. And, hmm, almost there. Uh, and, we have the, the, and we have the exception. A stack trace contains, as I said, the exception. If there is an exception, we can have stack traces without exceptions. This is also nice if you want to trace something. The function method call path to that exception. It tells us where, where we went to and what functions we called in order to get the error. And we can use this to actually debug what's happening. And this is easy because it's, all the information is there. All right. The first thing that people uh, do when uh, they're uh, debugging is to read the exception. And I showed you an exception that fits in a slide. But you will believe me that real world exceptions, especially if you're using frameworks, are like five scrolls long. And if you have a big exception, it's hard to read it because you have to scroll. And most of the code is not on your side. It's not your code, it's on the framework side. If you're developing Django and something's wrong with the model, you're going to have at least two scrolls of uh, Django DB models py uh, calls where something's happening and you get a value error at the end. And this is not really helpful. So my first advice when reading an exception is to find the line that separates your code from the framework code. Because most of the times it's not the framework's problem. Sometimes there are, there are bugs, but most of the times it's your code that actually broke. And if you're debugging and reading Django DB models stack trace, it's not really helpful because each time it's the same thing and then you get an error. And if you have a long stack trace, it can be your code framework, your code framework. The line that separates it is usually, if you start from the bottom and traverse up, is the, the first piece of code that's on your side, it's usually the code that triggered the exception. So this is like a tip for reading long stack traces. Just find this line, for example, here uh, in exceptions py line 10 in parse daytime. This is the line that separates after this I'm going in Python library. I'm not interested there. I don't know what's happening and probably this is not the bug because it's Python library that's been tested and in production and so on and so on. So if you find the line, you will find quickly the piece of code that actually broke. Uh, yeah, this is the line. It's in some list comprehension. I'm doing stupid things, just parsing the entire line as a daytime format, which is not actually right. So, there's a golden rule. If there's a bug and you can write a test for the bug, you should write a test for that bug. Because otherwise you're going to fix this and something else is going to break. And I call this constant regression and I've seen this in many projects and, it's, and this can make you crazy. It's like fixing things and breaking other things. It's fun if it's a game, but if it's a production code, it's not fun at all. So if you find a bug, write a test for it. And that's what we're doing here. It's for the slides if someone wants to look after this. It's a standard test, I'm writing a test, and the test is failing. So, we're fixing the code. We're writing a parse line function that's, that does the naive approach of parsing by splitting and taking the parts. So good. And we're running the code again. And as you can see, we started with an exception that some kind of a bracket cannot be parsed, and now we see some kind of a daytime cannot be parsed. And if you have a trained eye, you'll see the space in front of the daytime, and this is the problem. But if you have untrained eye, you can start getting frustrated. So when this starts to happening, there is an exception. You fix the bug. You think you are fixing it. You run another exception. It's the bugger time. It's probably the most popular tool in Python. I won't go into details for PDB and IPDB because there are really good talks in, on EuroPython for this. but. I prefer using IPDB since it drops me in a nicer shell than PDB. And the thing that we can do is set a breakpoint. I call this breakpoint, I'm not sure if it's the correct term, but you just put this on a shortcut in your editor, put IPDB, don't commit this on Git, it breaks builds. And once you run the code, all right, forgot the slate. 
So, pretty bit interactive Python debugger with console interface and stops the world and lets you look around. This is the nice thing about it. You ask the values of the locally and globally defined names and you usually find the bug this way or you start jumping on breakpoints or you start continuing the execution of the program and helps you look closely at what's happening. And it's the better print function. Everybody starts with print and then moves to IPDB. So when we run this program, we are dropped in an IPDB shell. I'm sure all of you have seen this or is going to see this and use it. And if I ask the second value, I'm going to see that here is a nasty little space. So we have a bug. We should not forget to add a test for it. We're adding a test. We're fixing the function by splitting by comma and a space because this is the format of our file and we're happy. Tests are passing. Now, if tests are passing, does this mean that we have a guarantee that running the program is going to be okay? Yes, no? How do you feel about it? No, no. Yeah, tests are good first step, but we need to run real world. And of course, running the program, boom, another exception. Index out of range, and as you can see, the exceptions themselves are not really helpful. It's value error, value error, index out of range. And this is by far the least helpful exception for me, index out of range. What? There's something really wrong with this, and I don't know why. So, more debugging time. I drop a PD IPDB in this parse line because I know this is the only place I use indexes. I run the code, and this is something that happens to uh, junior developers that start to understand and use IPDB. You usually drop IPDB in a loop where there's a uh, hundred, a thousand items that's going to be looped and you start hearing cont enter, cont enter, cont enter, cont enter. And after 10 minutes, cont enter, cont enter. <laughs> because you need, to, you need to get to the line that's actually breaking. And this is also frustrating and time wasting. It's good to do it once or twice, or when there's no other option and you're not sure what's happening, but IPDB, there's some nice context manager called um, launch IPDB on exception, which if we wrap the function and run the code, it's going to drop us in IPDB shell at the line that calls the exception. Saves a lot of time. It's actually pretty nice. And if I ask the value of parts, I'm going to see empty string. And it's one element array. Do you know why this is? For someone that, if you have parsed a lot of files, you know that files tend to have a new line at the end that if you split is going to result in a single item array with empty string. So this is pretty nasty. First time you hit it, you debug it. Second time you just know it and add a call for it in the list comprehension. We strip, if it's empty, we don't want it. And, all good, yep, fixed, fixed test passing, all good. Programs running, tests are passing, we're happy. And as you saw, the approach was, we started an, with an exception, we fixed this exception, which gave us another exception, we fixed this exception, which gave us another exception. And this is usually the step you're going to the steps you're going to follow when you're debugging. It's either you see the problem in general and you fix it, or you just fix this small problem in order to get to the second problem, in order to get to the third problem. And if you have tests, you can know when you're ready. So this is kind of everyday debugging. You don't try to fix everything at once. You just follow the stack trace and the exceptions. And in the end, if you're lucky enough, you're going to have a working program for at least some time. And there are some exception types that are quite, uh, how to say, useful and helpful, uh, like improperly configured validation error, permission denied. This is when the frameworks, uh, the folks, guys and girls that are developing the frameworks are nice and want to help you. And in Django, there is like tons of exceptions like improperly configured. You messed up something, they will raise you an exception and actually tell you what to do you're missing the meta model uh, field here on this class, or you cannot do this, or you need to do this, which is really helpful. And that's why reading the stack traces is good. Sometimes it can be helpful, sometimes it can be, it, it can be indexed out of range error, which 
at least in Python is good because if you're writing in C++, you, you're going to get segmentation fault, which is <laughs> even harder to debug. All right, and fixes should here, fixes here are easy. Just read it, fix it, all good. And to summarize the first part, stuck traces are your friend. If you learn how to read them, you're going to debug faster. They can be huge, so looking for the line that separates your code from the framework code is really helpful because it will save you a lot of scrolling and often the problem is not in the framework. Sometimes it is. And if you learn how to use IPDB, um, in my GitHub repo for EuroPython 2017, I've added some materials for shortcuts for IPDB. If you learn how to use IPDB, you're going to be really good at debugging, like seeing the stack trace, jumping around, so on. And if you hit a book, write a test for it. I cannot emphasize more on this, and the more I develop software, the more I realize that tests are really important and you should write tests. Constant regression, nah. I don't want no one to suffer from constant regression. All right, this was the first part. I have 30 more minutes, that's good. Second part, we learn how to battle with exceptions, but now nothing's happening. You run your program, there's no exception, there's no output, nothing. Sorry, nothing's happening. And this starts to get frustrating because you're in the dark. You don't know what, if you have an exception, you don't know what happened. If nothing's happening, <laughs> you don't know what's happening. That's the case. And you need to find some source of light. This is a detective work. You need to quickly find a way to break things. I'll go there in a minute. You need to know what should happen and what is the expected behavior because uh, oftentimes in students I see uh, they're struggling with something that's working and they don't know that it's working. They expect something else to happen and this is really bad debugging something that's actually working. So you should have a good idea what should happen and what is the expected behavior of the code. And of course, if you're in this case, doubt everything because there are some pretty nasty gotchas that we're going to cover that can um, make your hair white. And if there is no exception, the quick fix for this is to look for error logs. Sometimes you just open a web browser, it says 500. This is it, just a number, probably not the winning lottery number. And there's no exception, no, you don't see an exception. So you need to look for error logs in order to get an exception. And this is actually, uh, for me, this is the, more, the most important thing when I'm debugging something that's not, nothing's happening or something's odd. I want to break it on purpose. I start typing random syntax errors. I start raising ex exceptions left and right in order to get an error, to get the program to fail so I can fix it. And if I can break it, it's good. But if I cannot break it, then I, I need to isolate the code that's not working. For example, you're parsing some date times in a language that's not raising errors, for example, PHP. Instead of parsing date times in your entire big project, just take this piece of code, create a new file. This is like my most given advice to everyone. Create a new file and test it, test it there. Is it the same? Is it this code that you're debugging that's actually wrong or is it something else? Open a new file and do things there. And sprinkle with debuggers and trace every step of execution. You need to know the value of everything. You need to know what's happening in order to see why nothing's happening. This kind of sounded smart. I should, <laughs> this should be on slides. So yeah, code isolation is really your friend because if you're working on a 50 line Python script, debugging is pretty easy. You have 50, 50 lines, you can read them. But if you're working in a 50K Django project, sometimes you need to isolate the code, fix first the code, and then go back to the framework and integrate the code in the framework. It's more easy to work on something small than uh, the um, in integral part of everything with Django and frameworks. And there are some common gotchas that uh, actually happen in Python. And the first thing is module hiding. I was debugging why you cannot import date time from date from date time for about an hour when I realized that the student named his file datetime.py. 
we were reading the Python code, reinstalling Python, uh, opening issues. What's happening? Why? I, I open a repo on my computer and import it. I open a repo on his computer, I cannot import it. And in, in the frustration, I kind of changed directories. I managed to import daytime and it was all right. We were very stupid. This is daytime.py. Exception handling, my favorite thing. Someone catches an exception and passes. And there's nothing, no output, no stack trace, nothing's happening. It's really, really bad. If you're writing context managers, you can hide your exception really easy. I did this once. Uh, there's a third argument, that's the exception. You need to check and re-raise it. It's okay. We are used to this kind of noise in Sofia. <laughs> All right. And other common gotchas is calling something by string and making a typo and not having the code that's going to raise an exception if there's something wrong. This is also really frustrating because there's nothing wrong, it's just a typo, it's just a string that you're calling. A classic thing, you're debugging why this function is not working. Well, in the first place, we need to call this function. It's like um, uh, writing a main method in a Python script and forgetting to add if name equals main, call the, call the main method. It's really, really classic, classical thing. And editing the wrong file or running the wrong file. This is also debugging something that's working. You're editing something at one place and running the same thing, copy of it on another place. There is no way for it to be working. Here, breaking it on purpose works really well. If you add random rubbish syntax error and the program's still running, you're most likely, most likely here. You're r r editing your wrong file. And of course, debugging something that's working. This is hard to catch because you need to know what means for your program to be working or not. Sometimes you need just to know if this is okay. And an example. Uh, on Monday, I did a Django and Celery training here uh, on EuroPython. I have an orange badge, it's really nice. And I was, some uh, I was doing a live coding without preparation, which always goes as planned. And as you can see, I have no registered tasks here in Celery. It was working just a while ago. I did something, bam, no tasks. And I don't know what happened. Everything seems working, and I start to panic. And when I start to panic, I do this thing called binary search debugging, which is dump and also really nice. And it looks like this. I commented everything that I've added in user, user tasks py. It's working. All right, so here is the problem. I will get to the problem. I uncommented the task and the salary imports. Still working. Uncommented the app imports that I made. I broke it commented a specific import working, and commented that import not working, and I found a bug. And I don't know if this is an actual binary search, but uh, I like calling this binary search debugging because you're not putting your, how to say, your thoughts in, in the process, you're just commenting and checking. It's like git bisect, pretty much doing what git bisect does. And the generalized version of binary search debugging is comments on parts of the code that you just added so the program starts working and you're happy. And comment a smaller portion of the code that you have just commented. If, if this is working, then you can uncomment some more. If it's not working, then you go to step one, but only for the code that you have just uncommented and things broke. And by this, you, you kind of uh, narrow down the search area of, in, your, in your project so you know what's happening. And you don't have to think about this. You just need to comment and comment through and comment and comment through until you have a small enough code to look at in order to find a problem. And in the end, you're going to find the breaking lines. And I find this very, very helpful uh, because sometimes you're tired, frustrated, you don't want, and something breaks that should not break. You start doing this, you find a problem quickly, you're happy, you go drink some beer at the beach or whatever you like to drink. And a summary for nothing's happening. Try to get an exception. Like This is the most important thing. Try to get an error so you can fix this error. 
isolate the code so you know that the thing you're working on is actually working and then try to integrate it in your project because it's really bad to try to integrate something that's not working in a project that actually can break the thing that you're integrating. Yeah, make sure you know what needs to happen. It's really important. Don't debug working things because you won't find a bug. Or if you find a bug, it's going to be really strange. And try the binary search debugging thing if the case is suitable for binary search debugging, where you just comment and comment until you find a smaller portion of code where you can actually spot the bug or the typo. All right. Now, we know how to handle exceptions. Really nice. I love exceptions. You know the... Uh, famous thing that if your code runs from the first time, it's really bad. So try to get exceptions so you know that your code is wrong and you fixed it and now it's right. If nothing's happening, there are several things that you can do. But for me, the worst thing of all is everything's working. There is no exception, but you get a wrong answer. This is like the most frustrating thing because it's okay, but it's wrong. It's you. And it's the algorithm that actually needs debugging, which is hard. This starts to get hard and you need to be focused and you need to be thinking a lot. And when this happens, I usually follow this five-step five drip, drill down. I don't want this to sound clickbaity or something like this, but it's just five steps that I tend to do when I have a wrong answer. And the five steps are like from easy level to I should uh, change my job level. So let's check them. The first thing I always do is check tests because I usually test my thing with tests. And if I get a wrong answer, most likely my test is wrong. And if you're doing Django, I don't know um, how many times it was the case that you need to refresh from DB your uh, model instance because you have a different state in your uh, local test thread. And this is like fixing a lot of wrong answers. First, first check your tests. Write your tests good. Good tests are actually pretty hard to write. I, I find this that you can write code actually pretty good with good abstraction, writing good tests. For me, it's even harder. You need to put more abstraction, more thinking and not to make your tests need tests. Yeah, so check your tests. If the test is correct, maybe you need validation. Maybe you've passed some wrong input. Maybe you've passed something that your algorithm should not take in mind. So check this. Is the are the values that you're passing actually okay for you? Maybe you're passing wrong values. Then you need validation, and this is good. This is good because you add validation and your algorithm becomes more proof. It's going to work uh, more without breaking. Now, if you don't need validation and your tests are okay, then probably the next place you need to look at is at your algorithm. And I'm using an algorithm as a general uh, purpose code, uh, piece of code, not a uh, binary search tree or something specific that's called an algorithm. I'm using this in the most general sense. Is your algorithm correct? In order to catch correctness of algorithm, you can either get a computer science degree and try to prove it formally, which is a nice thing but takes a lot of time, or you can put uh, debuggers on each line of your algorithm and put your headphones on or go somewhere else where you can focus and start looking at values, start looking at steps. Is it from this step to this step do I, have, do, do I need those values or f find a place where values get wrong? And this is quite hard to do and requires a lot of focus, but for me, this is, this is working really nice. Debuggers everywhere, enter focus mode and start looking at values. And most likely you will see where things get wrong, especially if there are for loops, indexes, arrays, sets, whatever. And this way you can fix your algorithm. This is good, but things start to get worse. If your algorithm is correct, maybe your system design is not correct. Maybe you designed this and forgot for a whole dimension of the problem. 
It happens quite often. It's like you, you do something for timelines in the future and suddenly you realize you need to do something for timelines in the past. And you, you have zero code for this. You, you don't have the models in place for this. You have nothing. So here, starting fresh and going to the whiteboard is like the, the way to go. You need to step away from the code, think again, am I doing this right? And maybe call it again or change the code. This is really, really bad when it happens. It happens from time to time. And probably the worst thing that can happen is if you don't understand the problem space well enough. You have a wrong answer. For example, if I, if I start doing data science, if I get a, a wrong answer, I have no idea what to do. There, there will be something about matrices and vectors. And first I need to learn about matrices and vectors before I debug my matrices and vectors. I need to learn about the problem space. And this is bad when it happens because someone else needs to fix your code or you need to do some quick and dirty hack. And it's also good when it happens because it opens opportunities for new learning. And this is always good. And the, those were the five steps. Let me recap. Check tests, check validation, check algorithm, trace every step. Check system design. Are you actually solving the problem that you need to solve? And finally, check your uh, understanding of the entire problem space. Are you doing math and you don't know math, like, for example? And finally, some practical tips. Ooh, I have 10 more minutes, so I can go through my last two slides, five minutes each. All right. Some practical tips. Explain your pro problem to someone. I'm sure you've heard of the term rubber duck debugging. Sometimes there's no need to have a rubber duck. You have coworkers. You just you can use your coworkers as rubber ducks. Uh, when someone asks me to help, the first time I approach, I always, I always ask, ask the question, "What's happening?" The the answer is usually, "It's not working." And then I ask why it's not working. And then the person starts explaining to me why it's not working. I'm not sure I listen carefully everything that he's explaining. And suddenly the person is like, oh, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. I, I found my problem. I'm like, OK, I'll go down. Yeah. It sounds funny, but it actually helps a lot. And if the person does not find the problem from his first explanation, I ask again, can you tell it again? And then I start listening. So I can help. <laughs> but it really, it really, really, really helps um, explaining what you're doing to someone else, because then you're going to find. A, if you have some small problem, you're going to find it. If it's okay for you to talk to a rubber duck, talk to a rubber duck. Whatever you find suitable. Something I really like. If you're frustrated and you have deadlines and you have a problem and you're, you're not in your best mood and shape to fix the book now, but it needs to be fixed. You can practice the so-called par parallel debugging, which is ask a question on Stack Overflow, open a GitHub issue, ask a coworker, and continue working on the book. It's like uh, give more, more inputs to your, to your problem, because sometimes you're struggling with something, and someone on Stack Overflow actually answers the question and says, you're doing this entirely wrong, take a look at this, and then, you're, and then you're ready. Or sometimes someone on a GitHub issue says, I have the same problem, here is my code and system and whatever, you look at it and you find the problem that you're also having. When a coworker is thinking about it, also good, more heads in the problem. So this can, this is not actually nice because you're like, uh, firing random questions on Stack Overflow and GitHub issues, and I know people who are supporting open source, they don't like this very much. Because it's like, fix my problem at my work because I'm using your open source, open, open source library. Uh, so it's important when you do parallel debugging to uh, push back, not push back, but contribute back to the community. Answer questions on Stack Overflow. If you see someone asking a question that you've been struggling with for uh, a week, just sit down for 30 minutes and answer him so other people can see this. 
make pull requests for documentation. I love doing this when I struggle with something that's not really nice, nicely described in a tutorial documentation. I do it and contribute back to the documentation so other people won't waste time because uh, I'm not wasting time when there is a good documentation and people before me have done this. And yeah, uh, answer to issues, uh, help, help other people because this is the way it, it, it can get uh, better for everyone and waste sm smaller amount of, amount of time in bug fixes. And one specific tip for Stack Overflow. Yeah, 10 minutes. Read the small comments next to the answers because sometimes they contain the better answer to the answer. They're like really eight pixel phones comments, but they're also really good. And do a talk on a conference. It's nice to share experience and to be helpful to other people. And I guess this is it for me. Thanks everyone. If you have questions, we have like 10 minutes. All right, yes, we have nine minutes, 20 seconds for questions. All right. <laughs> Hi, uh, great talk, thank you very much. I just wanted to add to this parallel programming one crucial step, why we don't like it in open source and why, how you can make it, make us love you for doing this. When you solve the bug, go back to all those places where you asked about it yes. and write the solution there. And close your issue. Yes. Yes. This, that this changes everything, and we will absolutely love you for that. I agree. So, if you go to a GitHub and you solve your problem, close your issue, write how you solved your issue, make a pull request. Don't just leave it hanging there. It's, it's I don't know, it's bad. Great uh, talk. Thank you. I would like to know, uh, for example, uh, if you have a, a test that so many times works, and it so many times doesn't work. What is your strategy or the best strategy to fix this? Yes, so that's actually a good question. What do we do when we have this test that's working half the times, not working the other half the time? So we had such a test uh, a month ago. Uh, the thing that we did is run the test 100 times. It's like write a bash script, run the test, go, to, do, go grab a lunch, go back, collect the logs, see where it's failing and start debugging it. It was, for us it was a faker generating uh, names that were not compliant with our capitalized function and tests were failing and random. And it's, for me it's like run it a lot, see where it breaks, run a lot the point that breaks and check values, check what's happening. Why, why with this specific value it's, it's failing. Uh, if you have tests that are failing, it, it, the test may be failing because you have a different, um, how to say, system, operating system when you're running on, uh, for example, Jenkins. There was some really nice talk yesterday about dockerizing PyTest, like having the same operating system on your machine in Docker and the same thing running on Jenkins. So, so you, you need to do, this is like the nothing's happening, you need to do the, the detective work, find what's happening and fix it. It's a nasty thing to happen. Any other question? Have you considered using uh, more visual, visualized debuggers like WDB or built-in uh, ID debuggers like PyCharm debugger? Uh, I think this is like a personal taste. Uh, for me, it's whatever works for you. If you like more visual debugging, there are a lot of tools for this. I'm a person who lives in the console, so I debug in the console. It's a personal taste. Whatever works for you should be the tools that you're using. And I can, I am coming from Java world where visual debuggers are a thing. Like next, next, next. Whole day debugging. Right? Any other question? If not, I can ask a question. Um, Something not related to debugging, but I was curious, you mentioned something about the Code Academy yeah. in Sofia. Yeah. Um, can you give us, um, I don't know, a little idea of how long the course is and how long does it usually take people for people to learn and uh, All right. um, yeah. to learn Python, for, for instance? 
Yeah, so, so the thing that we are doing in Sofia is called is called Hack Bulgaria, and now it's being rebranded to Hack Software Academy, for whatever reasons. Uh, we do courses that are named Programming One on One with Python, which is a four month long course. We require some programming skills before you enter, and for for like four months we do quite a lot of stuff. It's like three times a week, four hours coding on place. It's not like just lectures. And it's working. It's intensive. It's working because it's intensive it, it, and it's the way to learn for us. Okay, excellent. Sounds pretty cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Any other questions? No.